but Violet House on the Hill is a cooperative horror game where players explore a haunted mansion trying to survive the terrors within. This game for three to six players will take you about an hour to an hour and a half to play. With multiple fairly chunky rulebooks inside, you might be a bit put off if you're trying to learn the game, but fear not, we're here to teach you the basics. Let's get spooky and learn how to play Betrayal at House on the Hill. First, separate the Trader's Tome and the Secrets of Survival books from the rest of the game's components. You'll be needing those later on. Players choose which character they want to play as. Character cards in Betrayal are double-sided, with a different version of each person provided on each side. Besides their general personalities, characters are important because of their unique traits, with some characters being better at certain types of traits than others. Forming a balanced team can help with the co-op side of Betrayal, but players are welcome to choose whichever characters they prefer also. Attach these little plastic arrows to each of the four trait tracks on your character card, moving them so they match the green coloured numbers, your starting traits. You can also find an official but free to download Betrayal at House on the Hill app that can hold all your character information for you as well. Take the omen cards, shuffle them into a deck and place them face down somewhere where all players can reach them. Do the same for both item cards and the event cards. Find the basement landing tile, upper landing tile and the longer entrance hall, foyer, grand staircase tile and place them to the side. Find all the rest of the room tiles, shuffle them and place them face down in a single stack. Place this stack within reaching distance of all players. All players then find their matching character miniatures and place them on the entrance hall space. Character miniatures can be easily identified by checking the colour in the background of the character portraits on their character card. For example, Flash has a red background and a red top. Take all of the game's dice and place them within easy reach of the players. Now to decide who goes first. Check to see which of the player's characters has a birthday that's closest to the current date. You can find character birthdays on their character card. The turn order starts from that character and moves clockwise. You're ready to start playing! Betrayal at House on the Hill is split into two different stages. The exploration phase, where all players are on the same team and working together, and the haunt phase, where players are sometimes split into different teams depending on the haunt. A set of various requirements decides which of the numbered haunt scenarios you'll experience during a playthrough. However, until the haunt happens, you'll all be exploring the mansion together, experiencing various spooky goings-on and gathering sometimes useful items. Turns in the exploration phase usually sees the players moving around the mansion's various rooms until they either come across an event, an omen, or they run out of movement. The number of rooms a player can move into and through is determined by their character's speed trait. For example, if a character has a speed of 3, then they can move through 3 adjacent rooms. Whenever you move to exit a room, there must be a tile already there. If there's no tile present, you'll have to find a tile matching the level of the house you're currently on. For instance, if a player's miniature is on the ground floor, they need to find a ground floor tile from the room tile stack. Players draw room tiles from the stack until they find a matching tile before flipping it face up and placing it adjacent to the tile they're currently on. Room tiles need to be connected by doorways. This means that a doorway shown on a room tile needs to be placed next to the doorway of another tile. Not all doorways will be able to be connected. That's okay, as long as there's at least one way in and out of the room. Some room tiles in Betrayal are special and must be placed in a very particular way. For example, the Mystic Elevator room only has a single doorway and actually teleports around the mansion whenever a player enters and rolls a particular number. Other rooms force players to roll trait rolls in order to cross through to another room, whilst others offer players the chance to gain rewards if they pass a trait roll. We'll get onto the specifics of trait rolls in just a moment. If a newly drawn room tile has the item, event or omen symbol on it, it means that the player must draw an item, event or omen card, immediately resolve it and end their movement. Item cards give the player an item, which is placed face up in front of them. It can be used that turn. Event cards can lead to positive or negative consequences, with some requiring the player to pass the trait roll. 
Omen cards usually grant the player a unique ability that may or may not be connected to the game's haunt scenario. Regardless of whether the omen card is an obvious item or not, the player must place it on the table in front of them. Some rooms and event cards will require the player to perform a trait roll. Trait rolls involve one of your character's four traits, might, speed, sanity or knowledge. An event might refer to a specific trait or refer to either physical or mental traits. Might and speed are physical traits, while sanity and knowledge are mental traits. If a reference is simply made about a physical trait, I can choose which physical trait to use for the applicable trait role. You're also allowed to deal out damage across both traits. So I might use my highest trait speed to try and pass the role, but take the damage to both speed and might, or just one of them. To perform a trait roll, the players need to take the number of dice equal to their current trait number and roll them. For example, if a player character has a 4 in knowledge, then they take 4 dice and roll them. Depending on the dice results, that player character will either pass or fail the trait roll. Whilst passes can result in positive effects such as improving your character's traits, a failure most always ends up in a negative effect. Whenever a player draws a room tile with an omen shown on it, they must take an omen card and make a haunt roll at the end of their turn, meaning they must roll 6 dice. If the resulting total is less than the current number of omen cards held by all players, then a haunt occurs. Whichever player causes the haunt to occur becomes the haunt revealer. This is important for working out the traitor and working out which scenario will be played this game. When a haunt occurs, the haunt revealer opens the traitor's tome to the first two pages and only the first two pages, and has a look at the chart inside. This chart will tell you which numbered scenario you're playing this game. The Haunt Revealer checks the omen card they just drew and the room they were in, and finds the matching entry on the chart. The number of the scenario you are going to be playing is shown in the space where the omen card and the room meet. They then check the chart below for the matching number to see which player will be the traitor for the scenario, if there is a traitor. This is often decided by whichever person is holding a certain item, or the person who was the haunt revealer. If one or more people could be the traitor, it's decided in one of two ways. If one of the possible traitors was the haunt revealer, they become the traitor. If not, it's the player closest to the haunt revealer's left. Whichever player is the traitor, they must take the traitor's tome and leave the room. They need to find the numbered scenario you're playing and read through the instructions. Refer to the Traitor's New Powers on page 17 and the Howl Monsters Work section on page 18 if you need anything clarifying about what you need to do. If there is a Traitor, their goal is usually to kill all other players. Sometimes they'll have more unique aims like trying to get a player character into a specific room with a specific item or a non-player character. The Traitor's Tome usually does a pretty good job of outlining exactly what the Traitor needs to know. But sometimes betrayal can present rules or elements in a way that appear messy and confusing. I'd advise playing a little fast and loose and not letting the rules take away from the atmosphere or the pace of the game. All the players who aren't the traitor become the heroes and must open the secrets of survival book and find the magic scenario. These players then read the instructions together and are free to discuss certain tactics and preparations. The hero's aims are often varied sometimes requiring players to find a specific room or item. All the necessary rules are almost always listed in the Secrets of Survival's book. Once both the traitor and the heroes are ready, they reconvene around the table and begin the haunt phase of the game. The traitor will often need to place some tokens or various other components in order to prepare the mansion for the current scenario. The traitor's tome instructs the players on what they will need to place where. The most important thing to note here is for the heroes to keep their objectives secret. The traitor is welcome to voice their plans if they wish to, but for the heroes to have any chance of winning, they should make sure not to reveal any of their plans to the traitor. All players have to tell each other what they're doing on their turn, but they don't have to reveal what preparations they're currently undergoing or what the overall aim is. Each of the hero take their turns, starting with the hero to the traitor's left and moving in a clockwise direction. The same rules from the exploration phase still applies to all players, except you no longer need to do a haunt roll after drawing an omen card. The traitor also gets to choose to ignore any negative or harmful text on room tiles and avoid being negatively affected by event cards. This also counts for the bite omen card. Once all the heroes have gone, it's the traitor's turn. 
Depending on the haunt, the trader may have any number of monsters under their control. These monsters take their turns after the trader. Whenever a player character attempts to leave a room with an opponent inside, they must spend an extra movement to do so. Before the haunt is revealed, none of the players can actually get into combat or be killed by anything. This changes, however, once the haunt phase begins. Depending on how a player attacks another, there may be certain stipulations as to where they can attack from and how they can attack. Like trait rolls, attacks can be split between mental and physical, with some items, weapons and abilities allowing you to perform a certain type of attack. A standard unarmed attack usually involves one player rolling their might trait against an opposing player character in the same room as them. Both players roll the number of dice equal to their current might trait. If the attacking player rolls higher than the defending player, then they successfully deal physical damage equal to the total they rolled minus the total of the defending player's dice. For example, if the attacking player rolled 6 and the defending player rolled 4, then the defending player takes 2 damage. However, if the defending player rolls higher than the attacking player, they deal damage to the attacking player. In the result of a draw, neither takes any damage. Successful attacks can sometimes enable player characters to perform certain special actions instead of dealing damage, such as the option to steal an item if the attacking player would do more than 2 damage, for example. Some cards allow players to attack using a different traits, or from a further distance. The revolver item, for example, allows players to shoot at another player character from a distance if they have line of sight, which is an uninterrupted straight line through doorways. These attacks are decided the same way as a normal attack, with players rolling the trait enabled by the weapon or item. Should a player get into combat with a monster, they will need to attack with a trait that the monster possesses. For example, if a monster does not have a speed trait, a player cannot attack them using their speed trait. You can ask the traitor controlling the monsters about any specifics regarding the monster's traits. Most monsters are only stunned once you defeat them, while specific scenarios might require players to kill the monsters. If a player character ever suffers damage, they must apply this damage to the matching trait. For example, if a player suffers 3 speed damage, they will need to move the arrow on their character card down 3 spaces. This may also reduce their movement. If any of a player's traits are reduced to the skull icon on their character card, they die. Some haunt scenarios involve hero players becoming traitors if they die. It's up to the traitor to inform the player character if this is the case. The heroes win the game if they manage to complete all of their objectives with at least one hero remaining alive. If all heroes perish, they automatically lose. The traitor wins if all the heroes perish or if they complete all of their objectives. Depending on whether the heroes win or lose, they'll have to read out the corresponding paragraph in the Secrets of Survival book and revel in their victory or mourn their defeat. Betrayal at House on the Hill might seem like a monstrously complicated board game when you start, but it's actually pretty straightforward once you've played a couple of rounds. Each scenario might present itself with some new rule challenges to overcome, but it's always better to prioritise fun over everything else. If you're looking for more spooks and shocks to sink your teeth into, why not head over to Dicebreaker.com for a list of some of the best horror board games out there. Thank you very much for stopping by and have a spooky day!